Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the eighth session in our not-for-profit speaker series for 2023. Uh, we're so happy to have all of you back, and we've got a great session here in front of you today. Uh, today's topic is going to be uh, an interesting one around uh, the use of cost and revenue analytics and determining the right model that might be good for your organization. So an interesting subject matter, uh, and here to take us through it are two experts in the subject area. We have Anthony Pember, who's a managing director with our Cherry Beckert Digital Advisory Group. And Anthony is joined today by Dr. Adam Rabb from Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. And together, Anthony and uh, Adam will take us through the presentation today. Anthony, happy to have you. I know you're in London there. And uh, just a reminder to come off mute, but before you do that, um, I got a question for you. Since this is about analytics, it's about data. Um, I'm just curious, do you know what type of food uh, collects your personal data? Anthony, can you hear us? I, there you I can hear you, sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> what type of food collects your personal data? I have no idea. That's a great question. It's a Zuckerberger, a Zuckerberger. <laughs> so with that, sorry, it's about as corny as they get. With that, I'll hand it over to you. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today and, and presenting this topic. Thank you, Matthew. I'm not quite sure how we follow that, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, my name is Anthony Pember, as, as Matthew uh, said. I am a managing director in Cherry Beckett's digital advisory uh, practice, and I have spent a career doing what I call cost and revenue analytics. So, so the stuff that we're going to take you through today is something I've been doing for my entire career. Uh, I've done it, started in Australia, uh, doing it for Navy uh, and, and Australian Department of Defense, uh, and then have been doing a lot of work subsequently in the United States. I have built models in, in the public sector, in the commercial sector, in the not-for-profit higher education area, uh, both in Australia, in the US, in the UK, uh, and in Canada and Mexico as well. So spend a lot of time doing this, have uh, also spent a lot of time seeing all of the issues and the hurdles, and, and hopefully we'll be able to share some of those uh, challenges, some of those interesting tidbits that, that we've learned over the years. Um, Adam, I'll, I'll hand it across to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Rabb. Uh, like they said, I am with uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, I've been working with a model that we have uh, developed and run here uh, for the past 10 years. Um, it was originally developed back in 2009 um, for a campus that was having severe financial struggles. And uh, it's gone through a lot of changes, a lot of developments, um, and a lot of troubles uh, over the years. And I, I hope that uh, you might be able to glean just a little bit of wisdom from um, all the things that we've gone through here at Ember-Riddle uh, to, to come to, the, to where we are today with the model we have now. All right, thank you, Adam. Uh, all right, so first polling question of the day. Uh, as, as you were reminded in that early video, please make sure that you answer these uh, to get CPE credits. So how would you describe the organization you work for? Is it large and complex? large and slightly less complex. And you can see a couple of tables at the bottom to give you some idea of what we're trying talking about in terms of large and complexity. Uh, but also are you midsize, complex, less complex, small, complex, less complex. So we're seeing a, we're seeing a fair distribution here, um, about 25% large and complex, 23% uh, midsize complex, uh, and then sort of equal weights between mid-size, less complex, small, complex, less complex. So there's not a large of, not a lot of large, less complex, uh, which is, which is makes sense, I suppose. The moment you get large, you start to get complex. Um, all right, we seem to have everyone answered, so we'll stop that poll there. Uh, and let's move on. Thank you for that. So the point of that poll was to give us a sense of who's who's in the audience uh, and help us understand what you've going through and what you've done so that we can uh, get a better sense of how to pitch what we're what we're telling you uh, to in the right way. Um, 
Okay, so today, what are we going to talk about? So we're going to, we've just done, obviously, the welcome and introductions. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what is cost and revenue analytics so that we can baseline everyone as to what we're talking about. And when we when we talk about this concept, what does it mean? Uh, we'll spend some time talking about the outcomes, benefits, and uses of the information that comes out of uh, cost and revenue analytics then we want to talk a little bit and spend some time about the different options, how you can do this. Uh, there are multiple ways to, to do this, uh, you know, from very simple to quite complex. We're going to sort of talk through some of those and then move on to what are the key challenges. And then lastly, a little bit about where to start. Uh, we will leave some time at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions, please feel free to to submit the Q&A uh, and we will address those at the end. We'll leave probably five, 10 minutes at the, to, to go through these things. All right, I think we now have a second polling question. What is your organization's experience with cost and revenue analytics modeling? So have you done it and you're doing it on a regular basis? Uh, have you done it once uh, and, and really need to think about doing it again uh, using something like an Excel? or you're looking to do something in the next 12 months, or you're saying, I don't even know what this concept is, uh, and hopefully you'll learn something today about that. So we're seeing a good mix. Uh, a lot of what is cost, reven cost and revenue analytics modeling, about 30%. Uh, we're also seeing uh, probably a steady mix, actually, on all the others. Some of you have done one-off studies in the past in something like Excel, uh, so yeah, it looks like a good mix across all of those, but a fair proportion of you, about a third, um, not quite sure what we're even, you know, what cost and revenue analytics modeling is. And so, as I said, hopefully we'll end up uh, at the end of this with you having a, a good sense of what that, what it means and how it might be able to help you. All right, let's move on to the next slide here. These are the learning objectives. Uh, you would have probably seen these when you signed up. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through them other than hopefully at the end of this session, uh, you'll have learned a few things about uh, what cost and revenue analytics is, how it will help you, uh, and you know what's the best way to, to embark on this and what are some of the pitfalls and challenges that you might experience. Some of the mistakes that we've made that hopefully you won't. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. All right, so moving on, what, what do we mean when we say cost and revenue analytics? Uh, so the, the way to look at this chart, and we originally developed this particular view um, as it relates to higher education. So there are a few terms in here that at the moment refer to higher education, and I'll give you a context to the larger not-for-profit uh, world as we go through this slide. But what it really means is taking different disparate data sets from across an organization. So things like information on your financial system, out of your financial system, uh, potentially even information out of HR or payroll systems, facilities, you know, what have you got in terms of, of facilities or other large assets that, that may, uh, you know, have a big impact on your outputs. Uh, we pull in information about timetables and schedules if it's higher education, student information, tuition and fee information. Uh, and if you're in a, if you're in a non higher education environment, you know, where we see things like timetable and schedule on this chart, it really means operational data. What are you doing? How often are you doing things? Um, when we're talking about student information, what we're using that for in a higher education uh, example would be to understand who are the customers? What are the products and services? What are the outputs of the organization? Um, and then when we're talking about tuition and fees, what are the, you know, where's the revenue coming from? What's driving that revenue? Uh, where are the, in a commercial state, it's it's where, what are the invoices? What are the sales? What are the discount strategies? Uh, you know, in a not-for-profit example, it would be, where's that revenue coming from? What types of donors? How much are, are they coming? Where, are they, where is it coming from? Is it coming from grants? Is it coming from individual donors? etc. We take all of this information and because a lot of it is is disconnected uh, in the underlying systems, we have to we have to pull it together. And that's where when we talk about a model uh, and modeling, it's really merging this information together in a meaningful way. So we we make allocations, we make business rules about how will we treat certain types of information. We make assumptions about the data. Uh, we we pull it all together with these assumptions, business rules, and allocations, and ultimately it gives us an output that is analytics and reporting information. So dashboards, charts, large amounts of 
of used quite often complex information um, that allows us to do all sorts of analysis and provides analytics opportunities. Those opportunities are really wide and varied. It could be as simple as understanding how many people and the expense related with certain activities amongst your, your organization to what does it take to deliver certain programs or certain aspects of certain programs? Uh, combining in non-financial information allows you to, to start to get to unit uh, cost information, uh, all sorts of other interesting elements of, of different ways of looking at, at uh, you know, cost, non-cost, uh, customer, product service, operational data views of the world. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to point out on this slide is that the value of this exercise when we talk about cost and revenue analytics isn't necessarily building this thing called the model. It's the analytics opportunities, the analysis opportunities you get at the back end. Building the model is very important and pulling all of this information together is very important because you need to make sure you do it in a meaningful, logical way that, that's correct. But that's not the end game. The end game is the analytics and the information and the insights that come out of that. Adam, anything to add on, on this slide? Yeah, I just want to say that, um, the, like you say, building the model is really, it's it's like the first baby step. It may seem like the most complicated, but um, honestly, sometimes it's a lot easier than it may seem once you get into your data sets. Um, but really, it's that last piece, the analytics and reporting, um, understanding what to do with it. Um, I've, I've had to field the question, what do I do with this? Many, many, many times. Um, and so honestly, that ends up consuming much more time and effort than the actual development of the model, which seems counterintuitive, um, but that always seems, at least in the higher education sphere, um, which can be very different, um, that seems to be the way that it works. Absolutely. All right, so just because we weren't giving you enough technical information, we've developed a slide that's even more technical. Um, Again, this was initially developed for, for a higher education audience, um, but if I go and click next, uh, we can give you a couple of points of view of where this relates to outside of higher education. But, but the way to read this is left to right. And what this is really trying to depict is is an example of how a, a quite complex model would be designed. And, and you'll hear later in the conversation we're having today about how there are different complexities and variations of how you can do this modeling and the cost and the revenue and cost and revenue analytics. Uh, this is probably indicative, this design that you're seeing of, of a really complex uh, model. It's, it's to, you've got these different modules, these boxes that you see, uh, and then the lines between them are really how you allocate and, and apportion the costs and the revenues throughout the model. So you read this left to right, top to bottom, essentially. Um, but the, the point of this is each module is, is being used to take all the dollars start in the left-hand side in the general ledger, whether that be expense or revenue. Uh, and then we're allocating it a variety of different ways. So if you're thinking about higher education, as this example is, is depicting, Revenues are accrued and generally driven by the students who are enrolled in different programs. So what we do is we would take the tuition and any fees and any financial aid that's associated with those students, any discounts, and we would allocate that all the way through to the programs that are that are really causing that revenue to be raised. Um, similarly, expenses, well, we've got expenses related to people, we've got expenses related to buildings and plants and plant and equipment. We have other expenses that just relate to activities that are done. Those are all being flowed through the model in different ways. Uh, and ultimately, we'll, the end game, what we're trying to do is take all those dollars that were expended or brought in to the organization and show them as they relate to the outputs of the organization. So the products, the services, the customers, the, the, the stakeholders, the, the um, people that are, that are getting the end uh, value out of, out of all of the activities that are being done within your organization. In a higher education example, it would be courses, it would be that, that are taught, you know, Accounting 101 is taught, or the program, the, the degree, the major that someone is, is uh, enrolled in. Um, it would be teaching, it would be all of the other non-teaching uh, non outputs, research, et cetera, that a, that a higher education institution does. Uh, in in an, uh, another not-for-profit example, it may be, um, it may be the, 
the the different programs that you're running for all of the the uh, end consumers of of the output uh, you may have a view that shows you information about the donors where the revenue is coming in you may look at different the different consumers of your services so there's a variety of different ways of building this the the point is to show that essentially you're taking information that's in your existing systems and manipulating it to give you a perspective of cost and revenue as it is as it's associated with each of the outputs of your of your organization Adam, anything to add on that? Yeah, so um, I, I think a, a point of clarity that helps, especially the non-higher ed folks understand kind of where this comes from, is that um, in higher education degree programs, you know, we've probably all been, I imagine all the folks here have probably been to college at some point in their life. They remember they, they enrolled in a program. They said, I'm going to go to XYZ school because I want to be um, an engineer. Um, and so you go to that school to attend the aerospace engineering program. And so the revenue gets brought in through that program. But what most don't understand is that once you get beyond that, um, the program does not have any kind of direct um, recognition in the financial systems because programs ultimately are taught by faculty who are in departments and they are made up of courses that are from all across an institution. And so breaking all of this into pieces helps you to see that mapping. And we call it at Ember-Riddle, we call it the economic cross-contribution, where you start to see, well, you've got faculty teaching courses over here, faculty teaching courses over here, but they're both contributing to the same degree program. And sometimes you just don't see that. You might be looking at it, well, uh, everything within a particular college or, or department or unit, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, and so really what this is trying to do is say, we've got these big numbers at the very top. How can we break them down into their unique components and then add them up in a way that is useful to understand? Um, just a last note, um, for us, the credit hour. Again, you probably all remember you went when you went to college, uh, you walk into a, 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 a course and it's a three credit hour course. Well, that means something. That's a certain load placed on the institution. And so we can then de determine a revenue and expense per credit hour. And as you can see, if it's a three credit hour course, multiply it back up again, and you start to be able to actually develop something you can use. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Adam. That's good insights. Okay. Polling question number three, what sort of analysis would you ideally like to achieve within your organization? So would you like to look at just direct expenses for certain departments and their outputs? Uh, would you like to look at both direct and indirect, but only for certain departments? Or is it something that you're looking across your entire organization? So if you were to build something like this, would you say, I need to look at all our, all our outputs, all our departments, um, and direct and indirect. So, so the preponderance of answers here is direct and indirect for all departments across your organization. That's about 60% of you. Next biggest is direct and indirect uh, expenses for select departments at about 22% of you. It's really interesting um, that, that there's a lot of interest in the direct and indirect rather than just the direct only. Um, I'm, a, I'm a firm proponent for the direct and indirect uh, because I think it, it tells you a lot. Um, all right. So thank you very much for that. That's great insight. That will help us uh, shape a lot of how we talk about certain slides coming up. Okay. So moving to the next slide, uh, we'll move on to expected outcomes and, and benefits that you get out of a system like this. So Adam, uh, do you want to talk through this, particularly as it relates to your experiences in at Embry-Riddle? Um, so really, uh, we found that modeling like this has been used in many, many different ways. Um, especially, it's one of those things when you start getting the right data in the right hands, it's amazing what folks can do with it. Um, so starting at the left, uh, margin analysis. You know, I, I, this is a nonprofit session, of course, um, but we all know that at the end of the day, you know, we have to make a certain margin, a, a certain, dare I say, profit in order to keep the lights on. Um, and particularly in higher education, if, if any of you have ever uh, have been monitoring the news lately, there have been many institutions that have really been struggling in this area. Um, you know, they, they put on a great put out a great product. They have phenomenal degree programs. 
wonderful students coming in the door, but um, they're not, they're just not making margin. They're not able to pay for their expenses. They're not able to pay for their faculty. They're not able to have enough left over to maybe be able to create funds for um, financial aid for, for new students. Um, and so really that's kind of the driver behind this. And that's what led us at Emory Riddle to develop a model like this. Um, we had a pro we had a campus, an entire campus that was basically to the point of being shut down. Um, and nobody could figure out why. We knew the expenses were were you know way too high and we knew that students weren't necessarily happy, but um, we didn't really have any specific information to really get down to what was driving that. Um, was it that we had a couple of failing programs that were dragging everybody else down? Um, was it that we just had too many faculty? You know, was our was our load too high? Um, and so really identifying the margins to be able to say, well, a particular degree program or administrative area or whatever it is that you want to label it as um, for us degree programs, um, are they not only earning enough revenue from tuition and fees and things coming from the students enrolling their programs, are they earning enough to pay for their own operations? So teaching pens and pencils, the faculty, uh, you know, their allocation of, um, of classroom space, you know, all those things, but also some sort of fair uh, uh, allocation of overhead. So from that previous poll, I'm glad to see that folks are interested in both the direct expenses, which for us would be those academics, and then also indirect, um, because I, I, I personally believe if you leave out the indirect, you're missing half the picture. Um, so if a, in a degree program at, a, at an institution of higher education, um, the, the students that are enrolled in that program, their tuition is paying for you know, those faculty and everything, but what about, you know, the president's office? What about uh, groundskeeping? You know, things folks don't tend to think about, the uh, the bursar's office, you know, the folks that, that take payment from the students. Um, is that program paying for a share of that? Because they're placing a load by existing, they're placing a load on those areas. Um, and so that's where understanding the margin and then understanding not just the direct margin, but then also that extra allocation it made a world of difference and we were able to turn that program around or that that campus around excuse me um where it is now performing extremely well it is i would say three to four times the enrollments it was that back in 2008 they started all new programs they're ranking really well with places like us news so just understanding your operation it makes all the difference in the world um Going into uh, budget planning and support, this is where we, we've kind of toyed over the years with, with using it for this. Um, basically, if, if we're going to be onboarding a new degree program, um, we use the data from existing programs to determine, okay, what, what's the cost structure going to look like for that new program? Um, we know approximately how many faculty we'll need and when based on enrollment projections. So using all that information, then feeding in the finance information from other programs at the institution that are similar we can build a very robust business plan for that new program and understand this is what it will likely look like, look like based on our assumptions. And if it doesn't, we can then go back and identify why not. Um, and so honestly, engineering, I always pick on that one. Um, you know, if we're going to onboard a new engineering program, well, we've got mechanical, we've got aerospace, civil, we've got all these others that we can compare to. And so we can say, OK, if we're going to include a new um, a basket weaving engineering program, um, then what's that going to look like uh, based on what, how everybody else is performing? Um, you know, and again, I, I do want to hit on that indirect again, uh, you know, understanding the load that is placed by some of the uh, extra departments, uh, my own being one of them, institutional research. You know, we're data folks. We don't really interact with students very much. And so people tend to forget that we're there. Um, and yet we're still placing a load on the revenue that's coming in from those students. And so understanding what that load looks like is incredibly important because we can have a bunch of programs that from an academic direct perspective are very financially robust. But then when you start adding in all those overheads, all those extra levels, all the VPs and the directors and the departments and the groundskeeping and the buildings and everything else, all of a sudden you have an institution that is falling on its face because it can't pay its bills to keep the doors open. And so that's why that is so incredibly important. Um, I, I think I'll leave it there. I've probably spoken enough on the subject, but Anthony, do you have anything else to fill in? Yeah, I do. Just a couple of things. You you mentioned two things. You said um, very early on, it was just a, a quick comment. You said if you're not looking at indirect, you're, you're leaving 
out half the cost. Um, and and that's that's a very true statement. Uh, you know, my experience in building these models for a large number of organizations, your indirect costs are, are, are somewhere between, I think the lowest I've ever seen was about 30, 35%. The highest of, of total, total expense across an organization, all the way through to up into the 60% range uh, for, for some that have a very large indirect cost. Now, some of that is it is what it is. You, it's the nature of the business you're in, um, but but there's always ways that you you want to be able to look at that and potentially refine it, become more efficient in the use of those indirect costs. Uh, but it is something that if you're not taking into account, you are literally leaving about half the cost uh, out of the equation and the analysis. The other thing you talked about in terms of margin analysis very early on, this is a, you know, this is obviously the audience is obviously not for profit. Um, I once had a, a, a client of mine I was working with and he said, you know, Anthony, we're, we're not for profit. Uh, and that's, that's, that's our mission. He said, but very most importantly, we're not for loss because the moment yes. that we have loss, we're not sustainable. So yes, margin analysis is something that, that people traditionally think about from a, from a for-profit organization. Uh, it, it is very important in a not-for-profit organization to understand that margin analysis, not because you're looking to get a profit, but you need to have a balance portfolio of outputs. Uh, you need to make sure that that at the end of the day, if something is losing uh, cost for you, uh, is losing money for you, because it, it but it's core to your central mission, that you've got something that can subsidize that so that you can deliver to that mission. So understanding that margin and having what I call a balanced portfolio of, of, of uh, outputs is, is important uh, and important to know as well. A couple of other points I'd just make on this. Um, you know, that program analysis, there's all sorts of things that you, you can look at in detail related to programs, break even points, you know, how many, how many uh, people do I need to be involved in that program, uh, to make sure that it, that it is something that becomes a sustainable program. Um, you know, what is the the ROI return on the investment? Uh, you know, what, the, what are we spending on it versus the, the success of the program, however, that may be measured, and it's very, it's varied. In higher education, success is difficult to measure and different to measure than you would have in in say a a food bank for example um but both of them have a, a mechanism where you've got consumers you've got stakeholders you've got customers who are using your services what is you what is it that you consider success for those and then how do you look at that and say are we are we getting a return on the investment and is this program being help being of use to to the end stakeholder whomever that may be uh, and understanding that program and the outputs associated with those programs uh, is very important to be able to say is this a good investment or could we be spending our our very scarce resources somewhere else where we would be getting better success for the end stakeholder I'd like to add one more point. Um, you brought up a, a great, uh, a couple of great points there. Um, I just wanted to add to it. Um, in my experience, I've, I've run into certain circumstances where um, you have particularly degree programs that are mission centric. Um, so the, the example that I always love to give is it was a religious institution um, that had theology programs and things like that. Um, they were programs that when they did analysis like this, they determined that they were, they were not money makers. Um, you know, they, they were barely able to um, pay for their own uh, needs, let alone any kind of, you know, overhead or indirect expense. However, that was okay. And I think that's a key element here is that sometimes just identifying the situation is important. It doesn't mean that you're going to be cutting something, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, or making, you know, making a change where, well, the theology program, it's not making money, so out it goes. That's not really the point. That theology program was directly tied to the mission of the institution. Being a religious organization, that was what they were there to do. Yeah, they had engineering, they had you know other arts and science programs, but that core program was incredibly important. And so, okay, we understand it may be a loss leader, but that's okay. We have other programs that can help to um, uh, uh, cross support it. Um, and, and provide some of that additional, you know, needed income uh, to make up for it. Um, and so I, I feel like that's really important to note that this isn't all about just, uh, you know, cutting things that are that are doing poorly or, you know, finding the bad guys. And again, we'll go into that in a moment, but um, it's really just to have a better understanding of your organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Adam. I mean, uh, 
understanding the organization in my opinion is the point of this game it, it's it's looking at the economics of, a, of an institution and and just understanding that better because that helps you make better strategic decisions in the long run and, and that's really the point of the exercise so these are a couple of examples we'll, we've talked about actually quite a few of these as on that last slide but you know a couple i'll point out if we talk look at differential pricing analysis in the top left hand corner um you know, it it really should just say pricing analysis rather than differential. But it, it's really if you if you understand the cost of of the services that you deliver, um, if you're charging for those services in any way, like a higher education institution does, then understanding what is that what is that price point you would put that at uh, is is important. Um, because if you don't understand the cost, you don't understand how to price it. I, I had an example where uh, there was a higher education institution that had lots of different programs and every student was paying the same amount of tuition. And they said there are some of these programs like the engineering programs and some of the, the science programs that cost a lot more to deliver just because of the nature of how they were being taught uh, to the point where the institution said, we really should be thinking about charging a different tuition rate or additional fees uh, for some of these programs, because it, it just isn't fair to be saying to the philosophy student as an example uh you know you're you're subsidizing the person who's taking taking the engineering student because they happen to need a whole lot of very expensive lab equipment uh and so that sort of that sort of uh differential pricing is important in some institutions and some organizations uh but if you're going to have that sort of concept of differential pricing or different fees that you would set for different services, you need to have an understanding what it costs to deliver those to be able to do that in a realistic way. Um, Break-even analysis we talked about uh, strategic enrollment planning. Again, that could not say that could say anything other than enrollment. It could be talking about donor uh, planning. Where where am I going to you know target different donors? Um, in this particular case, is strategic enrollment planning. It was it was looking at caps. A particular institution, higher education institution, had a cap on on how many students they bring in uh, because of what of perceived uh, space uh, limitations. Turns out that that wasn't necessarily the case in several programs and in the programs where it wasn't the case, they were actually making some good margin and they also had high demand for those services. So they were strategically able to think about removing caps on certain programs so that they could get increased enrollment, it would help subsidize other um, less uh, economically viable programs that were still mission centric, uh, and and really enabled them to to really pick uh, um, get a much more sustainable set of programs and portfolio programs. Uh, I've also seen examples where. Uh, not not for profits were looking at their donors and looking at analysis related to their donors and the revenue that was being brought in based upon certain uh, campaigns that were being run uh, and be able to strategically target certain donors. So the, this one example I'm thinking of, they were looking at the revenue brought in by the donors and the costs of the delivery of each of the campaigns, and they found that the revenue that was being uh, contributed, that, that was being provided by, or, or donors were providing, uh, once they got above donors above, uh, you know, five years of, of having not given money in the past, there was a huge drop off in, in the success in getting uh, any money from those donors. And what was interesting about this was, uh, you know, the organization said, well, let's focus on the, the, the donors who are giving more frequently and more often, even if it's lesser amounts, because the amount of money we're spending on the campaign uh, to raise money was actually bringing in uh, more money and was more successful. Uh, and so they focused and strategically uh, targeted a certain type of donor uh, under the under the and analytics was telling them basically that was the most effective way to be able to spend the, the limited dollars they had on running campaigns to, to raise money for the organization. Adam, anything to add on this slide? Yeah, I got a couple of things to throw in here. Um, you know, when, when you're building a model like this, you're being exposed to a lot of new data sets that normally most folks might not be. Um, you tend to cross over a lot of uh, data silos or into, into different areas of your organization where um, you're going to maybe be seeing things you've never seen before or you're seeing things in a way that others wouldn't have because they're so, you know, ingrained into it. And so... Um, what made me think of this was location planning. Um, as you're building a model like this uh, in higher education, using my example course, um, it, where you offer a course, a, pro, a, a, a class could make a big difference physically. 
Um, so if you're offering it in, uh, say you have a communications class, and just because of um, where a faculty member was located, you decide to offer it in a computerized classroom in an engineering building. Well, that's a very expensive classroom to run and operate um, because of all the equipment and just where it is, you know, the building that it's in. Would it not make sense, since you don't really need those computers, would it not make sense to instead uh, offer that class in a, uh, you know, maybe a teaching building um, or a less expensive building um, where, you, you, right, right, without really changing anything, you're cutting the cost of that of that course just by moving it from one location to another. And honestly, it see, it sounds crazy, but that's not something that gets frequently uh, looked at. Um, however, as you're building out one of these models, particularly one of the more advanced models that takes into account things like um, like location planning, um, you're going to start to see those those types of little tidbits of useful information. And while the model may not necessarily give you the perfect answer on how to handle that, it will end up creating more questions that you can go to the folks that can answer those and, and make better decisions. Um, with the differential pricing, you know, that engineering example is perfect. We've done that here at Embry-Riddle. Um, we determined that, you know, again, I, I don't mean to pick on communications, but communications is a pretty cheap program. Um, it's something that we can easily put together. Um, Obviously, aerospace engineering or, you know, fluid dynamics, that kind of stuff, uh, definitely not cheap. Um, and so uh, having those programs cost just a little bit more and, and understanding maybe what you need to ask for those programs. You know, you don't want to just double the cost and then watch your enrollments drop off. Um, you know, having a better understanding that, well, on average, it's a 30 percent more expensive program to run. So maybe we can do do a fee or something like that that helps cover that. Um and then monitoring key metric trends. That was the last one I wanted to hit on here, um, since I know we've talked about a bunch of these already. Um, this is where you might be monitoring metrics that are coming from within the model, but then the model doesn't answer everything. It's it, it's really more of a source of questions than it is a source of answers, at least from my experience. Um, and so we have a process here where we have a program review, um, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And actually, Anthony, if you wanna go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, Program review uh, is, is where we are looking at our academic programs and saying, um, you know, are we teaching the right thing? Are we teaching it by the right people that have the right qualifications? Um, and then we started kind of bringing in some of this financial information where we can say, yeah, it's an efficient program. It's It costs us nothing to teach, but meanwhile, the retention rates, the students coming back is in the toilet and they're not graduating, or when they do, they can't get a job because they're not getting taught the right uh, the right skill sets. Um, and so that's where a model like this is going to provide you with one piece of information, but you have to combine it with many other pieces of information in some sort of review like this, a program review, where you're getting a holistic view of what are, whatever it is you're analyzing. Yeah, Adam, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I always describe these models as they're not a magic eight ball. You know, you can't no. shake the, you can't shake them and say the model says do this. Um, they are another input into a into a normal decision making process, which requires both you know, objective uh, as well as subjective information more often than not. So yeah, good, very very good point, Adam. All right, so let's move on. Uh, next polling question. How mature are your data systems? So do you have significant data silos? Things don't talk to each other. You've got mostly unclean data, but you can actually get hold of it pretty quickly. Uh, you've got very mature data systems with pretty clean data. So you're, you're confident that you could do something with it. Um, or you're the, the gold standard, the creme de la creme. You've got serious data governance. It's practiced across all levels and you have no trouble getting your data. Okay, so looking at what's coming in here in terms of, of responses, we've got about 40% with mature data systems, relatively clean data, 33% odd saying mostly unclean, but readily available. About a quarter of you have significant data silos and a few of you have uh, serious data governance practice at all levels. Lucky you, I wish <laughs> I wish I had that. <laughs> No kidding. <laughs> um, that's that's a that's very interesting. Not not hugely unexpected. I think the numbers here track pretty much with what I would normally see. Uh, you know, about a quarter of the people have significant data silos. I will say that most uh, organizations I work with certainly tell me 
their data is bad uh, and and you know they think that they it's really difficult to pull together but ultimately uh, it, it's generally a lot better than than the organizations themselves think it is uh, so let's talk a little bit about the spectrum of options and modeling you know what sort of modeling options are available to you uh, so adam do you want to take away on this and i'll add some color Absolutely. commentary as needed so um when it comes to this type of modeling it may seem a little bit um uh, scary at first. You know, you take a look at this and you look at all those technical slides at the beginning and say, my goodness, how can I bring all that stuff together? Um, you don't necessarily have to. Um, it really, it, it's going to depend on your organization. It's going to depend on the answer that you gave to that question a second ago. Um, you know, if, if you're one of those that has the gold standard with the uh, data governance, you've got experts in each particular area of that data that can tell you exactly what it means and where it comes from, you're going to have a much easier time approaching the right-hand side of this uh, um, and, and the top, really, of, of this chart. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't still do something. Um, when our model was first developed, uh, we had a lot of data silos. Uh, and, and I know in higher education during that time, that was very common. And I, it probably still is, to be honest with you, um, where you've got data stored and it doesn't really talk to anything else. And you've got somebody who's probably ahead of a department or something like that that doesn't necessarily want you getting to that data. Um, however, that doesn't mean that you can't still use summary data to maybe start building something and at least get an idea out there. And so that's kind of where we got started. We said, well, we, we want to try to understand you know, the cost of these programs. So we can get to something like the income statement that's readily available and provided for everybody. And we can start breaking that down based on the data we do have access to. Maybe we have some student data or something. And so really the point is that you jump into this where you can and you start building from there. Um, and so you might be starting at the department level. So if you're a department lead um, or a department manager, you might have some, some very granular data within your own department, but you have no idea what's going on with the indirects and, and what's above you. That's fine. Jump in, build something, see what it tells you. And I, I can almost guarantee as you start to present that up the chain, you, you'll start getting more and more questions. And when you say, well, I can't provide that because you know I don't have access or whatever, you'll find that all of a sudden you do have access. And in many cases, it just takes that one person in the key position to say, I want to know everything I can about this. And all of a sudden this whole thing opens up. Um, you know, so here at Every Riddle, we kind of sit somewhere in the middle. Um, we do have an institution-wide um, direct and indirect uh, uh, analysis. We are still using Excel. Um, and I think that's maybe one area where we wouldn't kind of fit all the way to the right. Um, we, we still use Excel, and we, but we build three models, one for each of our campuses. We have three individual campuses at our institution, and so we are able to analyze all three of those. Again, we're able to look at directs and indirects, but you know there are a great many ways that we could do better at uh, breaking that, those data down in more uh, granular ways, more effective ways that would get us closer to that you know, predictive area. I've had that question come up multiple times from senior VPs over the years where they've said, well, can you tell me what's going to happen next year? Well, not yet. Um, and, and really, that's that's just based on the maturity of the model. You know, we might be able to run some very basic regressions or something like that. Um, but to really be able to get to that predictive level, you have to have a wide swath of data included um, to really be able to get down to the key drivers. And so I, I encourage you, unless you're really confident that your institution or your organization has the best data and the right people in place, I would avoid going straight to that very last point unless you've got help from uh, experts in the field. Um, don't do it by yourself. Instead, jump in somewhere around maybe the uh, college level or the, um, uh, you know, if you have different levels of departments somewhere in the middle, um, where you've got a wide enough data set that you can actually be able to start making some decisions from it. Um, you can actually start making some determinations and then let it run from there. Don't aim for perfect right at the beginning because you'll probably fail. Instead, aim for something that is, uh, oh, Anthony, you'll have to remind me, you had the best line for this. Um, directionally correct, I think, is that what it that, was? That is right. Directionally correct. Directionally correct. And, and that's okay because it's going to get you in the right direction. And each time that you update the model, you're going to be able to make little improvements. And that's what we've done here. You know, we've been running our model since 2009. The version that we have now 
um, really kind of kicked off in 2011. Um, and we've been using that same model ever since then, but each year we make little tweaks. So we discover something new. We talk to the right person that understands the data set a little bit better. And they say, well, maybe you could do something a little bit better with it here, or you're not quite understanding how it works there. Um, and so each year we make those improvements and get a little bit more accurate, a little bit more correct. And you'll find that even when you are just barely directionally correct, it's still going to give you some answers or at least point you in the direction of some answers you never would have thought of before. And so that's why I say, you know, don't aim for perfect right off the bat, but still jump in here somewhere and just start working towards it. Anthony. Yeah, absolutely, Adam. A, a couple of things here. Um, where it says department, you could also, and, and Adam touched on this, you could also have location. So if you operate in multiple geographies, uh, you know, you could say, I'm only going to focus on one geography to start with and and look at the outputs and, and the costs and revenues associated with that one location. Um, the, it does make the indirect calculations a little harder sometimes, particularly if you have centralized indirects that, that, that support multiple locations. Um, but, but it's not impossible to overcome. I, I think... You know, you can see the complexity variables on the right-hand side. The more you move away from direct costs and include indirect costs, it becomes a bit more complex. The moment you start to think institution-wide, it becomes a little bit more complex. Uh, the more programs or outputs, uh, you know, the services that you model, uh, the more the more difficult it gets. A couple other things I would say, um, you know, the direct and indirect and predictive, the, the, the bubble on the far right here, by the time you're getting to that, um, it, it's not something that's easily done in an Excel. Uh, it, it's probably something <laughs> where you're going to need some sort of specialist tool to help you with the regression analysis, maybe even the modeling side. Um, I think, and, and I'm doing I'm doing some work uh, playing around with this, but I think that there will be a role and watch this space in years to come in, in terms of artificial intelligence, particularly in that predictive side uh, and being able to take the information you may already have in systems like this and in models like this and start to pull it together and do some of that predictive work uh, without you having to put a whole lot of effort in because the AI is doing that for you. Uh, there's not a lot of work that's gone into that at the moment uh, in terms of cost and revenue analytics, but but it is certainly coming along. And, and it, it won't surprise me if in a couple of years we start seeing that from, a, you know, the AI is making that far right-hand side of this a little easier to crack because uh, it, it's doing a lot of the analysis on our behalf. Okay, so we've got about uh, 12 minutes left. So I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, Adam, do you want to just go through some of the key challenges? You know, what, what sure. keeps people like you and me up at night? Sure. Um, and so honestly, there, there's a couple really important ones here. Um, in higher education, we, we have a very unique uh, uh, governance style where we have this split governance between administration and faculty. And so really, that was one of the greatest hindrances to us here when we first started this model um, was getting the faculty side to understand and accept it um, to, the, to the point where they would get pretty upset with us, screaming matches and open meetings, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and really what that came down to was, A, a fear of being judged and being put on a report card, which we had to very clearly state was not the case. And that, and that comes back to my point about cutting programs and things like that. Ensuring that they understand that you're looking how to improve, not, to, not how to cut. Um, because they're looking at this and saying, well, you know, you're, you're just going to end up firing me or somebody I know or cutting faculty programs, et cetera. And that, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make improvements. Um, and so once we started to change that perception, um, it really made a huge difference. And really that came down to how we shared the data. Um, also, uh, in, ensuring that the right folks have the data. Um, and it goes to that last point there, weaponization. Um, you know, there, there's always certain people within an organization that can take a piece of data and say, uh, you know, I, I, I can attack something with this or, you know, or I can build myself up somehow with this. Um, and so making sure that the right people have access to it is, is always very important. Um, however, at the same time, I am very much a proponent of having everything as open and clear as possible. Um, and so, you know, we, we've kind of tried it different ways over the years with, with how much we give access to the model. And really what we've settled on is um, our, our key finance folks have direct access to the model. They can get in there and look at the formulas and say, okay, how, how is it, all this actually working in, in, inside of the model? Um, as far as our faculty and, and even like our senior faculty, our deans, um, 
you know, they, they have access to output reporting that has been simplified in a way that helps them understand what we are trying to get across without them getting wrapped up in the weeds. Um, and really that that has helped more than anything else. Um, you know, we used to put the model in front of everybody and my goodness, did it make things difficult. So just kind of understanding the best way to share the results with the folks who need it, um, that's, that's really important. Um, and the last point, agreeing on the business rules, um, having the right people in the room as you're developing a model like this is incredibly important. Um, we started off by developing this kind of on our own. It was done sort of within our own one little department. And then when we tried to share that with others, they said, well, who, who are you? You know, how are you coming up with all of this? You're touching on data sets from across the institution. Well, you know, basically what makes you so special? Um, versus now we have a much more open process where we've got the finance folks in the room with us. We've got the, uh, the asset management folks if we're looking at depreciation. We've got some folks from student, uh, student affairs in here that understand the student data. And so rather than the model relying on my credibility as the one running it, it's relying on the established credibility of all these other experts so that when somebody comes along and says, well, who the heck are you for, for sharing this information? It's not me. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the one that's putting all this stuff together and giving you something readable. If you want to know about where all this is coming from, you talk to the experts that you already know. And that, I can tell you, made all the difference in the world. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and um, just one just one thing time. to add on on this, uh, and I think it, it it's actually not listed here. the The propensity to want to overcomplicate what you're doing is is a natural tendency for people who model um, and and create these models. And so I would caution against trying to overcomplicate. Everyone tries to make it perfect, and in that quest for perfection, ends up overcomplicating things and confuses everyone. And it actually minimizes the value of of doing this exercise. So even though it's not listed in here, I'd say that keeps me up at night when I build models is, is trying to push back and say, no, you don't want to overcomplicate this because it will ultimately, uh, you know, cause, cause this effort to fail. Um, okay, next polling question. What capability does your organization have to conduct, have to conduct this sort of analysis? So do you have the capability uh, in-house? Uh, do you have it, but too busy doing other stuff? Uh, you're limited in your in your ability to do this, or you flat out got got no one to do it, and that's one of the reasons why you're you're struggling. So we're seeing a a fair amount of you saying probably about half saying you've got limited in-house capability, and then about uh, 28, 29 percent of you saying that you do have some capability, but it's dedicated to other initiatives. So again, that's that's typical of what I would see yeah. with with organisations I work with, uh, hence. You know, they mostly have limited in-house capability, hence why they asked me to come and help them in many cases. <laughs> uh, fairly obvious, I suppose, when I think yeah. about it. Um, but yeah, so that's that's uh, some interesting results. Um, I, I'm surprised a, a bit, a little bit about the number of people that do have the capability, but it's dedicated to other other um, initiatives. Okay, so let's let's move on. Um, I'm going to really whip through this pretty quickly. Uh, where do you start? So really, it's it's start with scoping and understanding. Understand your data, understand what it is you're trying to achieve. Once you've done that, you can then start to build that model, ingest the data, to have those conversations that Adam was Adam was talking about. Um, you know, to 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 really get an understanding of the information you're using. It's really important once you've developed that model or, or through the development process that you're validating and iterating. It's not just I've built it and I'm done. I can I can just start analyzing. There's always ways to improve, tweak, validate, and iterate that model. Uh, and then throughout all of this, you've got to be also making sure that once you get to that right point where that validation has occurred, you've got all the right analysis and decision making. And then obviously at the back end, you want to use it. Um, there's no point point doing all of this if you're not going to use it to help you know do transformational activities throughout this whole process change management is also really important to pay attention to um then my my final slide here is <laughs> don't wait to start just do it get running it. Uh, adam mentioned this earlier you know just get in there no matter what the state of your data is you will be able to get something out of it i can pretty much guarantee that uh so just get started start simple build incrementally and, and and get moving. 
So with that, we've got about five or six minutes for questions, I believe. Matthew, you were going to uh, to sort of ask us some questions based upon what's come in from the audience, correct? Yeah, absolutely, Anthony. Thank you. And thank you, Adam. Uh, a couple of questions here for you guys. Um, talk about one of the questions here is, do we have a model for this analysis? And we, we've, you've said the word the model so many times. Is this something that is off the shelf? Where do you get the model? Where, what is the model? Is, it, is there tools um, that you use? Kind of help, help us understand a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll quickly add. I, I, so I would say the most commonly used tool that I see is Excel. Um, the, and, and you'd use that if you've got, if you're starting simple, relatively simple, uh, Excel will do stuff for you. It quickly gets really complicated quite fast, um, Very much so, and yes. and when you get to a to a large model with lots of complexity, Excel starts to to literally break, um, yes. and that's when you start to have to use uh, some more complex tools. There there are specific tools that you can use that that are dedicated to to modeling and cost modeling and revenue modeling. Uh, they are fairly specialist, and you know most organizations will need help with those sorts of tools. I would I would then also say Matthew there isn't there isn't one model one there's not a magic model that fits everyone uh, I think there's a general concept and that's that flow of data that was was the first or second slide that I went through with the little boxes and the arrows that that as a concept is pretty consistent um, but the rules that you use the methodologies that the data sources will all be different every organization is different even within the same industry. I've built a lot of, for example, higher education models recently. Even though they're all higher education, every single one of them has had different different things that drive the, the structure and construction of that model. But it's still within that basic construct of I'm taking dollars, I'm flowing them through cost pools of some sort to the outputs. Great. Perfect. So there is no plug and play here. There is no uh, stick it into the, the the USB drive and it does it for you. Obviously, unfortunately, um, no. <laughs> yeah, I wish there um, was. It would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Adam, I think this question is for you here. Sure. So, you mentioned I think earlier that you've been working with your your model for Embry Riddle for maybe ten years or so. So, how have your stakeholders views of the model and how you use it changed over time? Sure. Um, so at the very beginning, um, it was outright rejected. Um, other than the few key decision makers that were really calling for it, um, like our chancellor and, and some of our, uh, like our CFO, some of the vice presidents, um, pretty much everybody else wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, they, like I said earlier in the presentation, they thought it was something that was going to lead to them losing their resources or something like that. Um, I can say without going through 10 years of history, we now have a very broad support for it um, where we have a, I, I, as far as I'm aware, it's the only one that's out there, a financial program review process where we are analyzing our degree programs from purely a financial perspective. And that would have led to pitchforks and, and, and torches on campus 10 years ago, whereas now it's very accepted. And it's because we're looking at it from an improvement perspective, not from a punitive perspective. And so honestly, uh, having folks getting used to the data, understanding where it comes from, understanding what we're trying to achieve with it, all of that has led to a significant shift in acceptance. Great, thank you so much, really appreciate that. Um, well, guys, I think we're right at uh, the turn of the hour here. So I am just going to wrap it up by once again, thanking you for your time, for your expertise and perspective on the subject matter today. Uh, really do appreciate it. This recording will be going back onto our website. So if you uh, want to reference it, it should be showing up there. It takes us a little few, few days to clean it up and get it posted, but look out for that back on our NFP series uh, website. Next up, we've got uh, session number nine, which is gonna be our annual 2023 not-for-profit tax update. Uh, look forward to that on December 5th, 2023 from one to 2 p.m., our normal time here, Eastern time. Um, uh, so we look forward to giving you a tax update then. Otherwise, I hope everybody has um, a wonderful rest of their day and week. So we'll sign off for now. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody.